Okay, and we are live. Oh, thought my camera wasn't going to come on for a minute. Oh, did someone forget to turn off their phone? I never have my sounds up. Do yeah, me. just, uh, you know, so unprofessional. Uh, thank you to those people watching either live or later in, in the future. Um, I'm Lance Nilsson. And I am Suzette Black. And we are uh, the Outcast Creative. Um, missing tonight is co-founder of the Outcast Creative, Dickon Tolson, who I believe will be joining us tomorrow around the same time, slightly earlier, uh, where we'll have the rest of the cast on tomorrow. Um, and the Outcast Creative, we do quite a lot of things, but it's mainly all based around workshops and performance, uh, doing stuff with actors, um, coming up with uh, different ways to use the live medium. Uh, but we're also gonna be down the line, we're gonna be doing some review shows um, about some of our favorite television dramas and Suzette and I will be telling you more about that another time, but you can look forward to that uh, with our future content. So please do hit the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed already, give us a shout out on your social media, uh, tell any of your friends who might enjoy our content to get in touch with us. Uh, or subscribe and you can also um, follow us on Facebook we have a Facebook page the Outcast Creative uh, surprisingly we're on Twitter I think are we on Twitter yeah we are on Twitter okay mm -hmm. glad I glad I knew that and um, yeah and if you're an actor who occasionally is looking for uh, workshops or likes taking part in table reads online I know we're all a bit fed up with zoom but we do stuff to keep busy, it's all about keeping busy mentally and, and also exercising the muscle of acting because it is a muscle that does need to be exercised. So uh, tonight we're gonna be um, talking to some of the cast and the man behind the next live streaming Outcast production, uh, which is called Henry's War. It's uh, an adaptation of um, William Shakespeare's Henry V, but the setting and the time period is transposed to World War II and specifically about the Allied invasion of Europe. Hence the, uh, the map you can see behind me. Um, so Suzette, uh, when can people watch the show? And the show is free, by the way, you can watch it completely for free. Well, the show starts, <clears throat> sorry, next Thursday um, and it will run from the 24th to the 27th. So that's Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 7 p.m. And it will be a four day run. And hopefully you can join us on all of the days or one of the days. Yes, yeah, the same, same show every night, slightly different from what we've done before. Um, yeah. Kent State was a different episode every night and we only did one live performance of each. Uh, this time the cast have four times to get it right and uh, the overall favourite show um, of the four will be the one that we'll leave up on our channel. Yeah. Um, but to see all four of the performances, you need to watch them live because only one of them is going to stay up on our channel after the performance dates. So um, if there's a particular night you want to watch, do try and watch it live because you, you won't get to see it um, necessarily another time unless it's the one that we pick out <coughs> i thought it was starting at 7 30 am i do i get that wrong or is it 7 or 7 30 so seven on the on the poster okay seven then yeah so rush in from work put the dinner on and come and join us for the outcast creative interpretation of uh henry v um or henry's war uh let's uh, on that note let's bring in the director first um outcast regular who's participated in many of our things and he was really keen to do this and we kind of encourage that we encourage initiative within our collective group of people <clears throat> and we like to um i can't direct everything nor do i want to so uh, it's great when other people step up to the plate and, and want to try something out so with no further ado flying in first class <clears throat> from hawaii is uh toby cockrell as you can see, he's lost his tan now. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself, sir? Hello. We're, Hello. we're bringing you in slightly ahead of our cast members. Um, we've got four, four of them. Oh, we did have Chris, but I don't know what's happened to him. So, Toby, you're directing uh, 
this adaptation. You've also written most of it. Um, tell us why Henry's War and maybe a bit about uh, what motivated you to want to do this. Yeah, well, um, I guess it started with um, Henry V. I was in Henry V at the Globe Theatre in the opening season. Um, I knew the play before that. <clears throat> I love the play. I love Shakespeare. And uh, I've wanted to put this on stage. Something um, that I've also wanted to do is to bring the plays and Shakespeare to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. So to reach a further, to reach an audience that it might not normally meet. So I kind of decided to use this process where I update the language. So Henry's War is not the Shakespeare play that we all know it is an, uh, heavily ad, ad, adaptated it's a, uh, everything has been changed all the dialogue has been changed in it to modern text and modern speech and I find this like appeals to a younger audience and uh, some people who wouldn't necessarily go to see Shakespeare or have any knowledge of Shakespeare much and I, you know I love to get everyone involved because there's something for everyone in the place so I absolutely love them so that was my motivation behind sort of transposing it and starting to write it. Did you have fun doing that? I did, yeah. It was, um, I was on holiday. Well, it wasn't really a holiday. It was a family vacation, family, uh, seeing family in America. And uh, I was there through for a large section of the last lockdown. So I was incredibly lucky to get out of the country. And um, I, I was working with Lance and the Outcast online. So I was still still involved and uh, I wrote half of it, most of it on my phone, which is really hard. <laughs> There's little buttons, you know, so it took rather a long time. But yeah, so when I came back and, and uh, talked to Lance about putting it up as a live show and he said, you know, we'd love to do it. Then I really started getting, getting, the, uh, getting, the, get the, getting the show developed, you know? Yeah. It was great fun though, I love it. It's been coming along quite nicely as well, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also adapted to the Second World War setting. Mm. I saw loads of parallels in the sort of struggle of Henry V in his time and the way Shakespeare wrote about it and the parallels with the struggle in the Second World War. You know, it's uh, like a might over might, you know, that uh, there's a lot of things that happen that are very similar in, in the way they are and, one of the biggest questions for me in the play is about uh, the responsibility of uh, the king, or in our play, the general, has to his troops, and the and all of the guilt and the emotions. It's all in there. So mm -hmm. that was something that I really, uh, I really felt was important. Uh, my favourite Second World War production has got to be Band of Brothers. It is absolutely phenomenal. If you haven't seen it, you've got to go see it. So that was a heavy influence on how I began to set up the structure of this in, in turning it into the Second World War. <clears throat> As you can see Lance's little background there of the D-Day landings. <laughs> and uh, you've got, I mean, some of the characters have been changed up to sort of work with that setting. So instead of the Archbishop of Canterbury um and is it the cardinal at the beginning in in henry yeah, in the original be. text we've got we've got churchill and is it churchill and chamberlain or did we no, change chamberlain no it's churchill and montgomery so churchill and montgomery that was it because chamberlain was kind of out chamberlain was yeah. sort of out of political influence by yeah, exactly but i was trying to mirror the the thing <laughs> in, the, in the original play is it's all about the church and state trying to convince the king to go to war so i try mm. to mirror that with Churchill and Montgomery trying to convince our general Henry to do the same thing. So, yeah. I yeah. It's, uh, it's and, uh, great. We've got to have Churchill. Bring on. Yeah. Him. And, um, <laughs> in the waiting room. <laughs> and uh, on that subject of um, uh, Churchill, um, let's bring in our cast that are waiting. Uh, we've got four of them coming in. Um, Rez Kempton, who's going to be live from Los Angeles. Um, Melissa Stanton, who is playing Churchill. And um, I'll show you a funny picture of her shortly. So this, I think this will be the first female version of, of 
Churchill ever. Uh, for those people really into their history, um, we're not trying to recreate history here. We're not going for accuracy. <coughs> There's loads of liberties where that's concerned. And this production is, I think the tone of it is supposed to be fun, as Toby has um, said. Um, and so in order to really convey to the audience that we're having fun here, you've got a female Churchill in the, in the very first scene. We've also got Penny Merlin Woods coming in and Henry himself, uh, Ed Glennie, all four of them outcast veterans. Um, three of them were on persecution. All four of them were on uh, 13 seconds in Kent State. So let's welcome in our cast. And here they are. Welcome cast. Uh, hey. All except for Penny, who oh, dive back into her seat. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Thanks for giving up um, an hour of your time on Saturday. Um, we're going to mm -hmm. try and keep this fairly short and sharp question <clears throat> answers wise. Uh, if anybody watching has any questions in the chat, oh, Maggie Reed is watching, do drop us uh, questions for your uh, for the cast or, or Toby. Um, so Suzette, what's our first question for our cast members? Our first here? question is, what is your first ever experience of Shakespeare, either on film, theatre, TV? Brilliant. Okay, well, we'll, 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 it's got to go to the uh, female, uh, first ever female rendition of uh, Churchill, Mel Stanton. <laughs> when do you, when did you first remember having your first experience or brush with Shakespeare? Uh, well, the first film one I saw, of course, was the Zeffirelli Romeo and Juliet. Mm. Uh, but my first live production was at the Redgrave Theatre in Farnham, the local Redgrave theatre, uh, where I saw Richard II with um, Derek Jacobi in the title role. Wow. My dad my dad took me to see it and uh, at the interval he said to me, oh, so what do you think? Expecting um, an eight-year-old's response of, I don't understand what's going on. And I started by saying, well, um, the, uh, the lead guy, he was um, gabbling his lines at the beginning, but I think that was because he was nervous and he's got a lot better and then went into a full-on adult critique of the first half. And uh, my dad just sat there with his mouth open, couldn't believe what I was coming out with. Was your father still there the following day uh, when you woke <laughs> up and got to school? Had he gone? No, he was still there. Yeah, still there. <laughs> <coughs> Good to... It's, that's quite cool, actually, that you got to yeah. see Derek Jacobi um, when you were eight years old on stage yeah. and also had some understanding of what you were watching. Yeah, well, I've, I've since found out that Derek Jacobi actually suffers from terrible, crippling stage fright. Oh. And um, it was the opening night that we went to see, and that's why he was so nervous. <laughs> but I didn't find that out until I was much older. I'm fairly sure, allegedly that Judy Dench told a story about him and another actor, uh, and I might be recalling this wrong, but who both used to suffer from nerves. I think one of them was, her, I think Michael Williams was the other one, was her husband. Mm. And there, there was a prop on stage where they both had a, they used to hide a bottle of whiskey in it. <laughs> and they would go behind it and sort of have a quick nip and uh, come out. I'm sure it made their performance uh, even more enhanced. Our cast won't be doing that no. uh, during their performance. Wow. Um, so fantastic. <laughs> has terrible stage fright as well. Yeah. You know? Fantastic. <laughs> have a bucket on the side for her in case she throws Here's up. Here's my prop. That nervous. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you'll know that's happening when her camera goes off. So sticking with the ladies, then on to uh, Penny, uh, the fiery uh, redheaded one, as she's known. Yeah, my first um, experience was when I was at college and I was doing Romeo and jo Juliet for English Lit. I was at college and I saw it. I saw the, um, the Zeffirelli film and I also went to see it at St George's Theatre in Tuffman Park. And then the second Shakespeare that I saw was um, my friend's daughter um, was at RADA and they did a performance of Midsummer's Night's Dream, which I got to say really brought it for life for me. I thought they did a really good job because I could just see how they were having conversations. And yeah, like it was, uh, my friend's daughter's name's Hannah Arterton and they did a fabulous job. So that's my experience of actually seeing Shakespeare live. 
Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Rez coming to us live from sunny Los Angeles, uh, yeah. taking a break <laughs> from the pool and the cocktails. Oh, yeah, tell of us, course. <laughs> tell us of your first, uh, first Shakespeare I, brush. I, I, what, what I remember at school, we used to, you know, read Shakespeare and stuff. You remember? I don't know if anyone remembers those animated series, Shakespeare. Oh, yes, they, they were yeah. awesome. Yeah, you know, so I remember us, you know, watching that. But my first, like, um, Shakespeare that I remember, you know, it wasn't animated, was um, I think we were doing um, Othello for GCSE English. And um, Olivier, yeah, Laurence Olivier with his black face. <laughs> we, they showed us that, you know, they played it at, at school, um, you know. Don't know if that'll be happening anymore, but um, yeah, I remember like thinking, "Wow, this guy, what's going on? It's so confusing," you know. So yeah, it was a black and white version, and then I think live on stage, I think like most people probably got taken to see Mid Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, probably, I remember a production maybe were taken because I grew up in East London, so. Um, got taken to Hornchurch, the, the theatre mm. in Hornchurch, the Queens was it? Is it called the Queens? I think there was a production of Midsummer Night's Dream there. It was like my first one and I thought Bottom was the coolest character. <laughs> he was funny, he made me laugh. <laughs> and uh, last but by no means least, General Henry himself, uh, Ed Glennie, <laughs> your, your answer sir. <laughs> I mean, yeah, first ever uh, experiences with Shakespeare were probably just some probably terrible recitals that I did when I was in primary school because you know get, getting a bunch of 11 year olds to do a full version of a Midsummer Night's Dream goes nowhere but well obviously that that can't possibly uh, screw up in any way but I think the first time I really um, got to know it I guess and got to really like it was probably something more like when we did Macbeth in English in secondary school and there's something about Although I know, it's, I'm supposed to say the Scottish play, aren't I? I'm not supposed to say the name of it. It's a terribly bad luck thing to do. But after having seen, you know, the Scottish play, there's something very, there's something very appealing about it because it's got, it's one of Shakespeare's darker ones. There's a lot of stuff to get your teeth into, and of course, the Zaffirelli experience, the, the very mad Zaffirelli experience as well, because that film is utterly insane as well. It's, it's a mad, mad film. Then I think there was basically Kenneth Branagh's Henry V, which is really good, actually. Really, really good. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Ken will be passing me 20 for that quick uh, plug for some of his earlier work, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, sadly still yet to see any of it live on stage. But, um, yeah, last year put a bit, of a, a bit of a stimmy onto that, really, didn't it? But, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, that's about it for me, really, I'm afraid. And, uh, uh, can I go? Can I go? Yeah, coming to <laughs> you. You say the best till last, Toby. Oh, sorry. <laughs> go for it. Yeah, um, I was just going to say, it was, it's mentioned, a couple of people mentioned Midsummer Night's Dream. And that was my first play, 11 years old in, uh, um, God, where was it? Hackney, uh, Hackney Fields. Hackney Empire. <laughs> oh, Hackney Fields. They, uh, oh, it's yeah. a brilliant, brilliant company called Foot Spam Theatre. And they have a top you know big tent that they put up they go all over europe all over england they played inside theaters outside but this show was just as an 11 year old i watched this magical thing unfold in the middle of a you know hackney fields in the park inside a circus tent and it was just a magical experience it's a brilliant company if you ever get a chance they're still running and they're still going are they give them a little plug yeah yeah they were at the globe theater uh i think three years ago now Three or four years ago now, but yeah. Midsummer's Night's Dream does seem to be a, a bit of a popular one to sort of, you know, oh yeah, yeah this is one we can take the kids to, and they, they, there's lots of pretty animals and strange fairies and magic. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Very Disney. <laughs> yeah, so I, I get why uh, that one's quite popular. Um, I, um, I can't remember what the first stage production of Shakespeare was that I saw. I've seen quite a few. But I do remember that I didn't get into Shakespeare, nor did I get it as a, as a, I don't want to say art form, but in terms of how it's used, how the language is used dramatically, I didn't really understand it until I saw Kenneth Branagh's Henry V. Yeah. And uh, I remember seeing the trailer for Henry V, and it was a very well-cut trailer with a lot of action, explosions, Branagh on a horse going, Rah! and, you know, fighting and all this kind of thing. And I thought, oh, great, a period war film. This looks, this looks 
cool, I'm going to see this. And uh, it was um, pre premiered at the, at the Brighton Film Festival, which was supposed to rival Cannes. I think it lasted all of two years. Um, I think it was 1988, I want to say, or 89. I think it was 89. And that was where it premiered in the UK at the Brighton Film Festival. And I saw it there and I just loved it. As soon as it came out on release, I went straight to the Curzon in uh, central London and watched it again. So uh, I also need to give credit to Ken. Mm. And I think his, his Shakespeare productions, um, the films, are all first rate, mm. uh, especially Hamlet and Henry V. I didn't take too much ado about nothing. That really did look like an excuse for them all to go to Italy and live in a villa for a few weeks, do a film and get pissed and eat lots of good food. But yeah. Um, yeah, hence the title. Do it, why not? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you could really yeah. tell, but, you know, but yeah, it's clear that they had a, a really good time making it. I'm not sure I had as good a time watching it. Yeah. But, um, I, I saw Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet live at the Barbican and he had a beautiful way of being able to speak Shakespeare and sound like regular talk, regular language. It just came out naturally. Mm. And not everyone gets every every inch of it, but uh, that was sort of my drive as well. The most common thing I hear people leave Shakespeare plays say, I loved it, I loved it, I loved it, but I didn't know what they were saying. <laughs> or I didn't understand the language. So yeah. it's written in English, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I really, really want to bring, you know, the drive behind all of this, really. But it's quite wordy English though, isn't it? Yeah. I did, I did yeah. remember. Also, you know, 300 years old. So. Yeah. <laughs> I did also see Hamlet at Hackney Empire with Ray Fiennes in it as well, like a long time ago when I worked at Ticketmaster. Oh, really yeah. yeah. Wow. Was that, was that good? Yeah, that was good, actually. Yeah. I saw um, Richard III at the Young Vic. Donald Sumter played the ghost of the king and the murdered father. And it was a dark-haired Welsh actor who played... Hamlet, his name momentarily escapes me, but he was exceptionally good. Um, that was probably the best Shakespeare I've seen on stage. And they had, did it with a samurai vibe. So it was all like samurai, you know, the metallic sort of samurai costumes that always looked like robots. It was all yeah, sort of that kind uh, of vibe. Was it Japanese mask work? They do this thing called mask work, where it's like all mm -hmm. Jap Japanese, uh, I better get this right. Udo? Kabuki. Uh, yeah. Kabuki <laughs> Theatre. That's the one. Kabuki Theatre. There we go. Um, so, Suzette, what's our next question? Mm, who are you going to be playing in the Henry's War performance? Oh, well, this should take not too much time at all. So, uh, Mel. I am playing Churchill, uh, Flewellen, the Welsh soldier and Alice, the uh, lady-in-waiting to Catherine of France. Fantastic roles. Excellent. Did you, have you seen Ian Holmes' interpretation of Flewellen? I have, yes. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely the best one of all time, I think. Yes, yeah. We, um, we don't have, we have, the cinema got taken down in Farnham years ago, and uh, they briefly started running cinema in the, um, the Memorial Hall, which is right at the bottom of my road where my parents live. Um, and I saw it there. Do you think we should explain what Churchill is doing in Henry V? I already, co I already covered that in the intro. Oh. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. Yeah, we are, we, yeah, we should also explain. I haven't that seen that bit, this, though, right? This also like... isn't all Shakespeare. This is not Shakespeare. It's Shakespeare-based. And there is a lot of Shakespeare in there. So I challenge anyone watching it to spot your favourite quotes. But uh, it's... Uh, yeah, no, we, we covered how this is a different interpretation of history. A bit like the uh, recent production of Anne Boleyn. Um, yeah. we, we, I think maybe our motivations are slightly different. But So first female ever performance of Churchill, as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, that, Mel will always have that mantle. Yes, so, uh, absolutely. Yeah. We'll always pave the, uh, the way for other actresses to play Churchill. Yeah, you'll be my Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. Um, Penny, what are you playing? Yeah, I'm playing Montjoy, who is the ambassador to the Germans. And I'm also playing Bardolf, who is an English soldier. And I'm playing Ava, who is uh, a German lady too. Are you going to have a prosthetic nose for Bardolf? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got the hat. <laughs> got my hat. 
Oh, Penny, don't don't spoil the uh, Sorry. <laughs> don't spoil the surprises. Spoiler alert. Okay. Um, so uh, contestant number three, what's your name? Where'd you come from? Uh, Rez, who are you playing? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm playing Westmoreland and uh, Gower. Um, I have a lot of fun with those roles, especially when teaming up with Llewellyn. So <laughs> Melissa's my partner in crime for those for that Gower double act. Was, Gower was played in Branner's production by my good friend Danny Webb. Oh, awesome actor. I and love that, Danny Webb. Yeah. And that's how I met Danny yeah. um, because I, I was on the set of uh, Henry V for I think, oh, wow. one day. And um, by the way, when I saw the trailer for the movie, I didn't realise it was the film that I'd been on the set for. How dumb am I? Oh, wow. <laughs> There's a company doing the stunts for the, the show called Stunts Incorporated. And I, I can't remember this is so long ago. I vaguely recall a friend of a friend was was going on as an extra and he somehow blagged me into Shepparton Film Studios and I ended up standing next to Danny Webb where the archers were and was talking yeah. to him for nice. quite a while. I know and you and I have spoke about him before, you know, because yeah. I've always said think he's Fantastic such an amazing actor. actor. Come on, come on, Britain. <laughs> Give him a knighthood. Get him up yeah, there. Yeah, he's so he's underrated. Awesome. Such a great actor. He's so underrated. And yeah. uh, he was in that rather plodding Christmas drama, The Dig. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw that. Oh, yeah, yeah. About that, they're unearthing the boat. Yeah. True story mm. of the Viking boat that got unearthed or the mounds or whatever. And um, Danny's in it and he's he's playing a, um, a manservant and he's got about four lines. And I'm like, this is one of the best British actors of all time. Totally agree. How dare you put him in such a small <laughs> role at this point in his career? He should, he should have been the lead. But, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, what can we say? I'll have to send him this. He'll be very chuffed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, uh, uh, Ed, you're playing Henry, no, no one important. Um, yeah. so, a couple of lines, minor. Yeah. So, Ed, you're doing, you're doing Henry. Yes, yeah, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing General Henry, not King Henry, because um, in our adaptation, it's at the time when kings didn't do a huge amount of frontline fighting. Yeah, it's, um, there's, there's a few lines here and there. There's a, there's a couple <laughs> of moments, you know. Just a few, a few short little scenes. It's an add-on question to this. Um, how difficult is it, do you think, the, the St Crispin's Day speech is, is kind of like the go-to speech that kids used to do to get into drama school. Uh, it's the one that everyone advises you not to do now because they've heard so many versions of it. Um, how do you do that speech and somehow make it fresh and original when it not only has it been done to death, but also Kenneth Branagh's version of it in Henry V is just so definitive. It's so passionate and raw and real and the music and the timing, everything about it is just completely perfect. No pressure, but how do you, uh, <laughs> how do you bring something fresh to, to, to that? I think genuinely by not trying to bring anything fresh to it, I think if, if you're trying to do it either similarly or differently to how another actor's done it, you fall into so many traps because you second guess every decision you make. You worry, is this is this bit too similar to the way it was done before or this is too similar, I've got to make it different. I think the thing with doing any kind of heavily Shakespearean dialogue is to make it as basically cut through all the words and try and find out what the meaning behind them is and put the raw emotion into it mm. and you know making it distinctive from anyone else's versions of the matter i remember watching on um the, the hollow crown series and their version of henry v i feel almost went too far in the other direction of being similar it, it was almost just trying to be different i felt in some places it was being different for the sake of being different and I think, you know, whatever anyone's opinion on, you know, I mean, our opinion's glowing on the matter, but whatever anyone's opinion on Kenneth Branagh's Crispin Day, Crispin's Day speech, there's so much in there which really gets to the heart of what that speech is that I think any parts which happen to imitate it just means, well, you know, not to blow my own trumpet, but great minds think alike at that point. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good speech, well performed. But I think it's a matter of just i mean it's an easy trap to fall into sort of you find yourself saying these things and thinking yeah this sounds like ken Branagh's version but 
if you're delivering an impassioned speech and another actor's delivered the same speech in an impassioned way, it's going to sound similar in some ways. Yeah. I think it's just a matter of trying to find out what you can personally understand in that speech, what you can personally bring to it, because that's where every actor differs. You meet the character halfway when you do any role, and it's about that bringing together of the actor and the character. No one's Henry V is going to be exactly the same as any other actor's Henry V. I think it's just trying to find that that humanity in there as to what you know. It's not just a it's not just a king or in our case a general giving a speech to his soldiers. It's it's a, it's a person trying to find trying to find everyone else's courage, find their own courage in a in a very dark and dismal moment, and eventually find something worth something worth holding on to in a moment where they could all quite easily give up. It's the authenticity, and, isn't it, as well? Because you're having to rally mm. your troops. That's very personal to you as the character. And so therefore you're not going to emulate yeah. someone else's idea because you're feeling it within the scene. So that's what's come across during rehearsals. So you're lucky. Oh, thank you. On that. <laughs> well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you answer a difficult question. And that's yeah. why he's Ed Glennie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so Toby, are you playing? You're playing third spear carrier in a tree. <laughs> yeah, I'm playing uh, anyone who drops out at the last minute. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, that's always a very, that's a very important role. Yeah, yeah. and, and of can course, require... we're all online, and you know the, the productions we've done before, we always have cover. So you know anyone who drops out on the night, and uh, my voice will come on from a scary unseen place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, and my, none of that happens. So um, yeah. So yeah, I couldn't remember if you were doing a small role in it or not, but you're just going to be covering. Yeah. So when we do live performances on Zoom, we usually have a male and a female uh, cover. I think probably on this, as we got quite a small cast, we'll just have the one, and that'll be Toby. Yeah, playing Sometime. both male and female, which oh, I do. Ready to do a high pitch voice. <laughs> yeah. it needs to be. I've, I've done it before in Henry V, by the way. Uh, I understand your female church is really interesting. And I just want to say, we're talking about Kenneth Branagh's Henry V. I was, I did the opening season with Mark Rylance. And Mark Rylance, Henry V, totally different, utterly brilliant. And I've noticed this with casting as well. When you've got, when you're casting it, especially this or, or anything I've cast before, you've got probably you know if you're lucky five different uh, versions of the same role all equally as good and then you have to go oh no what do i want from this one thing that is gonna you know make the 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 difference in the show or how that relates to everyone else so making that final decision you know everyone's versions are equally brilliant you know it's just they're very different each person brings their something of themselves to it yeah so it's what echoing what Lots of different ways to um, skin a cat, as they say. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. And for those people watching at home, please don't uh, attempt to skin any cats. We are all about non cruelty to animals here at the Outcast. Uh, so, Suzette, what's our next question? The next question is, how are you grasping the text? I like the way you said that. Very, you know, you put your own spin on it. I do, yeah. Uh, how are you grasping the text? Uh, and by that, we don't mean how do you pick up your script with your hand or a tweezer. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose so. Maybe we could uh, expand on that a bit. And uh, If it's the first time you've ever done Shakespeare, do say, and, and maybe about the challenges of, of that. Uh, we have only got about 18, 20 minutes left. So let's keep the answers uh, quite short and to the point. Uh, just uh, so we can get to our last question as well. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think we've got any questions from the audience at this time. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, um, <clears throat> Penny, uh, first time doing Shakespeare? Yeah, it is the first time I've actually done Shakespeare. I've, obviously, I've read it and seen things, but it's the first time I've done it. But I find that I kind of am picking up the language and understanding because I'm, you know, I realize that. You know, it's just a conversation that he's having, even though it might be using more words or wordier than perhaps people would use today. But, you know, I find that I can really grasp what the meaning of what he, what is being said. And, you know, I'm finding it enjoyable as well. So, you know, 
I find I have got to grips with it pretty well, I think. Yeah. Good. I mean, it, it's interesting that we, we had um, some of our outcast regulars who'd normally be up for doing any show going, but were a bit afraid of, of jumping on this because they just either don't get or, or haven't taken to Shakespeare. And, you know, it's not for everybody, but it's great that those people that haven't done it before have, like, embraced the fear and... Um, I tried to tell them it's not Shakespeare. <laughs> it's <laughs> yes, you can't it. say that because I'm heavily I'm, abridged. <laughs> but, but for our advertising, but I mean, it is still Shakespeare, but it's yeah. a spin. It's a modern. Yeah, modern. yeah, lots of the languages there. Yeah, uh, Mel, first time for you. No, I've done um, quite a lot of Shakespeare before. Um, I've also played men in Shakespeare before, um, and I. I've always thought that I've been very lucky in that I didn't do Shakespeare at school. I found that a lot of people have had Shakespeare ruined for them by doing it at school, yeah. where it's, um, it's just taught really badly. Um, and I think also my dyslexia has helped me. Uh, when I, The very first Shakespeare I did, I played um, Titania in Midsummer Night's Dream. That was the first onstage Shakespeare that I did. And because I was dyslexic, I, I didn't kind of look at the whole meter thing or anything. I just read it. Um, and I think that really helped me, actually. Yeah, I just want to jump in. I am also very dyslexic. What I love about Shakespeare is that as dyslexics, we're all on the same boat all of a sudden. Nobody, <laughs> everyone has the language difficulty that we experience with all regular writing. Yeah. So it's, uh, I just wanted to you know, yeah. say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Ed, uh, not the first time for you, I don't think. Uh, no, I did um, with um, some other people that I know in online sort of theatre circles, did a small excerpt from A Midsummer Night's Dream, which um, is obviously very different in flavour. But it, again, with Shakespeare, it's just about finding the meaning behind the words, because, you know, in much the same way, you know, they're all saying the same things that we they're all thinking the same things. They're just saying it in a considerably more verbose fashion. Mm. But I mean, that's the simplest thing. I just try and think, well, you know, boil it down to the simplest intentions. And then you've found all of the words then start to make sense because the emotion behind them is as simple and pure as it's possible to be. And suddenly all the do's and thou's and forsooths become basically human instead of some scary long list of words that you go what on earth are they saying here yeah hmm. thank you Who's Rez? Next? Rez. um yeah um for me i mean i'm just gonna echo a lot of what what my friends and colleagues are saying as well and i think it what melissa is saying definitely how it's taught at school makes a big impact on on, on how we feel about Shakespeare and you know not every not all of us get to go to drama school and have to work on text and and, and learn and kind of that's where I kind of like learned to love it really because before that it was just something I have to do for my exams you know Shakespeare and so um and I suppose for me I think every director's approach and what's wonderful is that workshop Toby led you know for us before we um we did this production about the joy of the language you know and making your own and he just took what was and thank you toby for making this you know you create this atmosphere of not making it so rigid you know what i mean there's certain people that yeah. we might work with that are purists and want it pure yeah. and everything and but but you you really brought a sense of like just explore find it yeah. for yourself and everything yeah, and really, that has been uh, a wonderful I really had that thing of uh i was work with children with shakespeare and, and part of what i did was to update the language in order for kids to get into it yeah. And then, you know, for all those reasons you just said, and that led to me doing this, this first time I'd done it for a whole play, though. This is quite yeah. an adventure. Sorry, go on. No, no, I was just going to say, and that, and that has brought, you know, your take on it, the adaptation and everything. So, you know, it, this is a great way into Shakespeare. If you haven't, you know, if you haven't, if you've been avoiding it, you're thinking it's not for you. I think this is a great um, jump into jump into it, really. And, and I think you'll have a, you'll have a good time and uh, learn learn stuff because there is a lot of the language still in it but it's very accessible and i, I love the take on on it um i did see a production of um on film of ian mckellen doing richard the third and um they had that whole war that was, that was a great film 
That yeah, really brain. good film, right? And I, uh, yeah. that really made me, oh, yeah, Shakespeare, you can really do a lot with it, you know, because it moved away from the traditional, yeah. you know, um, uh, Shakespeare. And that had a sort of World War Two vibe, didn't it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Iconography was like, you know, it was like, you know, the rise of Hitler, you know, yeah, yeah. as Richard III. I thought it was a great production, really, really good film. Yeah. So, yeah, I remember, I remember those. And, yeah, and uh, I'm just, and having fun with it. I had saying, you know, finding what you're going to bring to it, you know, the language, the words are there for you, but you can play, you know, and different productions of different takes. And uh, and that's what I love about our, our, our version. And we're really telling a, a story that people may know, might have heard of it, but I think it really distills what, what Shakespeare was trying to do. And remember, Shakespeare was for the masses, right? You know, we yeah, kind of feel it's yeah, elitist. It's only for certain people. But actually, you know, the Globe, if you look at the Globe Theatre, and what it was, it was to appeal to, the, to, to everyday man. To the grand <laughs> yeah. And back then, unlike today, it was, it was the, the poor league. people who got to get really close to the to the cast yeah. on stage. Not <laughs> like the house, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, right, we've got time for one more question, uh, Sue. So, what you got in your magic hat? In my magic you don't hat. Don't need to ask Toby what Shakespeare he's done because he's told us all already. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's basically uh, well, we got two, but I'll go for the one. What benefits have you gained from doing all these read-throughs online, the classes, and the performances with the Outcast during this time that we live in? That we're living through. Good question. Um, yeah, fantastic. So just a, a quick summary then of, uh, for anyone watching who doesn't know the history, uh, The Outcast started as a face-to-face -face improv acting workshop on Monday nights with a view to doing one or two theatre productions a year. And in fact, we started off by just going straight into rehearsal for our first show, started the lessons after that. And that was 2019, that all happened, um, partly inspired by the sad passing of our previous teacher, Graham Fletcher Cook, who many of the people on this call knew personally and were students of his class at Timber, which was an improv class, similar thing. Um, and then uh, I was getting lots of frantic calls uh, from our actors all feeling rather depressed. And then we, we thought, oh, well, maybe we can do some script readings online and we tried them on Skype and that was a bit of a disaster with Kenny sounding like he was speaking to us all inside a dustbin. <laughs> but then Zoom came along and uh, it was the perfect medium. And then we actually realised we could do performances too. Limited performances, but I think we're pushing the envelope with everyone and doing something different with everyone. So so that's yeah. that's the background of how we all came online. Um, some of us haven't met in person. Me and Rez have not met in person yet. Uh, in fact, me and Ed have not met in person yet. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's because there's a restraining order. He's got to stay away from me. <laughs> Five hundred right yards. I've met you, Lance. <laughs> <laughs> met anyone else? You've about twenty of those, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's loads of us that haven't met for, from the cast of all of the productions, which is is nuts. Oh, really? Anyway, so yeah. So uh, Rez, let's start with you as you're furthest away. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally Lance lifesaver, especially during the pandemic. And, you know, we're, we're you know, as actors, you know, we, we tend to spend time in each other's company. Right. And you know, we're sitting alone on your own. Some of us, you know what I mean? You know, um, in your apartment or flat or house. And so, yeah, having this as an outlet has been fantastic. I think the classes that you do amazing, you know, um, that you um, have this um, openness to, to invite people in and 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 you know some of the productions we've done as you said Lance you know using zoom as a new medium uh being so innovative um you know using the backgrounds using the whole thing getting a composer involved the music everything and streaming it you know on YouTube so people can see it live because the people have missed you know theatres are closed aren't they people have missed live performing and mm -hmm. the fact that it isn't just recorded we do it live I think is um, adds that extra element, and um, I've loved it. Lifesaver for me. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, and let, let's uh, just remind people to keep the answers short and to the point, uh, as Rez just did. Uh, Mel. <laughs> um, so I met you, Lance, at a workshop organised by my agent, um, Elaine Eagleston. That's right. That was yeah, that's in twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen. Oh, God, it seems longer, but yeah, okay. Yeah, um, oh, and um, 
shortly after meeting you, I had a hospital appointment um, where I was having a minor issue with swallowing and they put a camera down my nose and he pulled the camera out and looked at me and said, how are you still breathing? And it turned out I had a, a five centimeter, nearly two inches tumor growing in my throat that was actually covering my airway. Can I just um, say to those people watching, this is unconnected to the fact that Mel met me at a workshop. Uh, it is unconnected, yes. Um, but it, it's kind of relevant. It, it ties in eventually. Go on. Um, and shortly after that, I had um, very major surgery uh, to remove the tumour. was in hospital for several weeks with a feeding tube. Um, had to have three months off. Uh, couldn't work at all because I couldn't eat. I, I, I had to relearn how to swallow. And I got a filming job and it was just, I come home to Farnham to do the filming and it got cancelled the night before. And a couple of days later, we went into the first lockdown. Wow. And wow. so having had uh, three months where I couldn't work, I couldn't use my voice. And then I was going to be working and was unable to, to then be able to come and do things with the outcasts online and to do actually get into performing um was just it was an extra layer for me on top of being in lockdown and not being able to work there was the fact that I very nearly probably could have never worked again yeah I, I'm, I'm just kind of stunned that I'm hearing this for the first time now mm. <laughs> and, uh, to, to hear that you, you went through all that and uh I, it's funny, I know a lot of people that had a really, really rough 2019. Forget about yeah. 2020. Mine wasn't good yeah. either. And, yeah. Um, you know, and I, uh, yeah, I mean, well, well, you know, all credit to you for coming through it. And, yeah. Um, well, I spent the whole yeah. of last year waiting for the results. I, I actually didn't know whether I had cancer or not until um, a year after the operation, till um, October last year. I found out that it wasn't uh, aggressive cancer and I'm cancer clear. Hey. Um, so, you know, we can't guarantee uh, that attending outcast workshops will cure your cancer. But you are certainly willing to give it a go. We'll try. Um, see, we'll try our best. Uh, joking aside, that's just an incredible, I'm quite moved actually. Yeah, um, <laughs> and that, that's a very potted version. We didn't yeah. know what was happening. It, it's, a, it's, a long, it's a much longer and uh, more involved story, but that's the yeah. potted version. Yeah, I can imagine the fully potted plant version is uh, very exciting. Um, yeah. Well, uh, credit to you for coming through. I'm glad if we were able to contribute somehow, even in the smallest sense. Um, you know, I really, uh, I really am glad to hear that they were a, sort of a bit of a beacon in the in the mm. darkness, as it were. Definitely, um, fantastic. yeah. Fantastic. Okay, top that penny. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, it's been a lifesaver for me actually, because I live on my own as well, and it's really kept me connected. I've really, you know, kept my acting muscles flexed. You know, like the the, the table reads that we were doing, and being able to perform on the Zoom performances. It's really it has been a lifesaver for me because, you know, sometimes it can get a bit depression and, you know, with everything that was going on and feeling kind of cut off. And you know, funny enough, I have actually met more people in the last year or so online than I probably would normally, which I've, I've noticed. Like, I actually made more friends. I haven't necessarily met them in person, but connected with more people in the last year through um, the acting groups that we've been involved in and yeah it's really been uh, and it's been you know it's been great doing the zoom performances because you know they are live and they are you know that adds that kind of like oh my god you know because you want to get it right obviously and it's it, it, i and i love doing acting i do i love the whole process of it so it's been fantastic for me you know living on my own having this this it has been a, a lifeline as well and being able to connect with everyone yeah, until you said that i hadn't really thought about the number of new friends i made um mm. of which definitely the fabulous one's got to be res um mm. of uh people that i haven't met yet yeah um <laughs> so i obviously ed's a close fourth 
Um, but um, <laughs> there's several that I, I haven't met. Ed and Rez are two of them. I think there must be about another 10 or 12. Yeah. I think I've only met you. You've only met me. Well, you, yeah, you know, yeah. you're not the best one, so you're all right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, no, you've met Dickon. You've met Dickon, haven't you? I think I have. You've met Jake, who's an outcast, because he's been in a couple of things. Okay. Uh, he's been on some table reads and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I just hadn't really thought about that. And um, what I love about doing the stuff online is it's all about the work. Mm. It's the first time I really feel like I've got to focus on directing. I, th I think my directing abilities, uh, uh, even though I'm not on an actual set, are le leaps, leaps ahead of where they were two years ago. Because there's no one coming up to me saying, oh, you know, the hotel owner's car is blocked. <laughs> complaining. <laughs> Yeah. We do, I'm trying to trying to work with the actor. Yeah, but you know, and time and and hang on, that light that light's blown. We don't have any of that. It helps just... when you can mute everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I, that's love being, I love being able to mute everybody. Mute the room. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that on a set. Um, yeah. So while it has its limitations, while it has its limitations, it has some major pluses um, <laughs> as well. Um, fantastic, Ed. I can see you itching to give us an answer. <laughs> You're like hounds at the starting gate, waiting to explode, something like that. In the hounds in the way. slips, uh, eager upon That's the, the one. Yeah. something similar, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, um, so for me, ironically enough, 2020 was supposed to be the year when I got back from my holiday in February, but I was going to apply for the Bristol Old Vic's um, summer drama school. Mm. Of course, that went spectacularly well, because, you know, as it did, 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 as it did for everybody, um, but yeah, th this has been pretty much more than a lifesaver. I, I came into the Outcasts pretty much entirely by chance through through some other table reads that I was doing. You know, it was getting together with other actors online, which I'm, who I'm still in touch with. So, hey guys, I still know about you, still think about you. But yeah, just sort of, I met Lance through one of those table reads. I got invited to do um, some table reads of a series he was writing. And yeah, it was it was just really good to, you know, go from about six or seven people all meeting online, five of whom would sometimes not turn up at a time to a table read of about 20 odd people, all of whom were, you know, just turning up week after week after week. And it's been incredibly good. I mean, the limitations of Zoom, I think, make you a better actor because it's it's got all of the disadvantages of various schools of acting you've got the impersonality of filming in front of a camera instead of opposite a human being you've got the problems of it being live so you've got to really think on your feet you can't muddle up your lines and at the same time you have to muddle through your own tech as well you've got to sort your backgrounds out you've got to sort your your camera feed out your sound out it's there's so much to worry about so if you can do acting when you've got all of that to worry about when you go, when, you know, the world opens up a little more and you go back to doing any sort of acting, be it live, be it improv, be it, uh, be it theatre, be it film, you've had some experience in that, in that sort of thing. And it just really makes a big difference. So, yeah, I mean, it's been absolutely priceless to me. I've met some amazing, amazing people. Um, yeah. Most of whom are on this call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I've met some amazing people. I'll be really glad to meet you in real life, especially Rez, when I uh, hopefully get a very big job and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, get, you get a nice join in by the pool. Get to join in by the pool sipping cocktails. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. go to. I, I don't even know what these swanky restaurants in LA are. That's how uncultured I am in that sort of circle. But we do know that we're all looking forward to Rez taking us to one. So, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, some really well, good, good points raised especially about the the way that this actually really trains you uh not only to work well under pressure but but you know again like i said it focuses me purely on the directing focuses the actor aside from all the other things they have to take care of but really to focus on their performance and uh you know act to a screen where there's no one there um, a bit like if you're doing a film with bruce willis you know when it's after his close-ups are done he's in his trailer so you know you have to do that um, allegedly. So, uh, Tony, uh, Tony, Tony's not here. Toby's going to fill in for him. <laughs> <laughs> your, your answer in, if you could give us an answer in six words. That'd I'll be keep it. it brief. Uh, lockdown is shit. <laughs> We're all suffering. 
um yeah this has been a lifesaver for me uh i found it really tough to on this thing to 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 direct people i'm i'm a very sort of close and personal director and actor I need to bounce off of people i need to you know see them in the room you can have tiny little conversations between yourselves none of that is available to us but uh yeah my hat's off to you lance that this is uh a space and uh, the outcast has become something I never imagined. I had a similar experience lockdown where I signed with a new agent determined to get back on the horse. I've, you know, taken a few years out bringing up my, my twins and uh, yeah, I signed with a new agent two weeks before the lockdown. Well done there. <laughs> so yeah. So then uh, there wasn't an audition for at least a year. And then, uh, and then it's this weird self tape, and uh, I'm just a bit uncomfortable with self tape. It's, uh, and, but it is what we do here, and I think it's probably going to be the future of the industry. You know, first auditions are going to be run like this, and uh, yeah. you just tape in, and that's the way it's going to go. So everyone out there, all your actors and people who want to do this, you need to take Outcast online classes like this. <laughs> to learn all those skills and abilities and uh yeah. yeah i just thank everyone for being involved i've had a blast already and i know we're coming up to our last week of rehearsal our last sorry five four days of rehearsals yeah. and then live shows and i just <laughs> feel so honored to be part of it thank yeah. you guys well guys uh oh that's a terrific compliment and i did hear all of it from the bathroom while i was dashing out for a quick break kept <laughs> <laughs> the volume up really loud yeah um, such is the size of my lodging. Oh, did, you, did you hear I said that in a Shakespearean tone? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so, okay, so just a few things to, uh, first of all, thank all of our cast and director, Toby Cockrell. Oh, thank uh, you. For coming on tonight. Uh, Thanks, We're everyone. doing another one of these tomorrow at seven o'clock um, with... Um, the rest of the uh, well some of the rest of the cast i don't know that everybody's going to be on but we're going to have a few more people do come and uh, join us then messages of support from uh Josie Ayres and Anne Hazel for mel uh, for getting <laughs> through your uh predicament um and thank uh, you and says she's going to make you up a batch of smoothies and uh, bring them round <laughs> so um <laughs> Uh, subscribe to our channel if you haven't. There's going to be more um, shows like this down the pipeline. Actors doing crazy things on live Zoom performances. We've also got a subsidiary channel that we're working on that's going to be reviewing uh, drama, t television drama shows um, of a certain genre and narrative. I don't want to say too much more about that now, um, but Susan and I are working on that at the minute just to expand our channel content and it all kind of links into acting because we're talking about great drama shows, which always involve great acting. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got four performances of um, Henry's War, starting at 7 or 7.30? 7 o'clock. Yeah. It's, it's right above me. Look, oh, it yeah, it's on the poster. <laughs> Funny I thought to look at that. Yeah, man. 24, 25, 26, 27. Well, I think it was, yeah, we, we usually have a fairly long lead in with our lives. So get on yeah. at 7. Remember, it's it's performed live Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, same time, seven o'clock every day. Uh, it's, a, it's roughly about two hours. There'll be a 10 minute interval. So, again, you've got, you know, time to get a snack or go yeah. and uh, pester the lady with the ice cream tray. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's quite a tight, tight, fast pace production. It's a lot of fun and it's free. Yeah. 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 It's enough, but it's free. It's yeah, entertaining yeah, you yeah, to love. watch for free all we're asking you to do is subscribe to our channel let people know about it and obviously give our actors some work if you see anyone you like or you've got a part for someone with a beard <laughs> mel is available <laughs> and she can adapt to the role that you'll see uh with, with churchill bigger. so um oh, mel's like the, the, the master of disguises she's got many hats literally she actually <laughs> does have many many hats more, more hats than i've got baseball caps <laughs> um, oh, so yeah do subscribe Suze have I forgotten anything I'm sure there was something else we were supposed to say before the end no just as long as we gave out the performance information for people to go and uh, check out our our page our YouTube page <laughs> yeah so it's the Outcast Creative on YouTube you'll find it really easily there's also a Facebook page 
the show starts streaming about five to ten minutes before it starts. We we run it on the on the Facebook page. If you for any reason can't find the YouTube, if you subscribe on your YouTube, it will come up on your feed anyway. And um, yeah, do we we please share the love and uh, share it on social media and all the rest of it. So it just uh, remains for uh, me to say um, good night from him. And uh, <laughs> from him. Yeah, you, you nearly got it. Never mind. We'll have oh, some Frederick <laughs> course on that. You can tell this is improvised. So, uh, actors and uh, Toby, thank you so much for giving up your time, not only for uh, this evening, but also for the show um, as well. It's great when just people get together and collaborate and say, let's do something. We've got a bit of free time. Let's do something. Mm. And uh, this is the next one of that. All right. So, um, Thanks very much for watching, guys. Do please uh, spread the word about the show. And um, remember, only one of the four shows is going to stay up on our channel. Um, we're going to pick the best one. That's the one that's going to stay up on YouTube. If you want to see a particular performance, you've got to watch them live. They're not all going to stay up afterwards. Just like theatre. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> up to the theatre in your own living room. Yeah, just like theatre, except it doesn't cost you 70 quid. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll see you all soon. Remember, we're back tomorrow at the same time, interviewing, or slightly earlier, I think, interviewing uh, some of the cast uh, as well. And we'll see you then. Do join us tomorrow. Subscribe. Stay safe out there. Wear your mask.